There was an old, abandoned school in my town called the Florence Condon. It was the junior high school and then the elementary school until construction constructed a Trenton Middle School and Elementary School. Even though it was abandoned, they did not demolish it right away. Some of the windows were boarded up, others weren't. The doors were definitely sealed shut, but there are other ways of getting in or getting out. The older the place became, the more stories there were about the place. Questions started beginning to ask by students of the new middle school. Why was Florence abandoned? The teachers of the new middle school who knew who had worked at Florence simply replied that the new schools were bigger and better. It simply left the old one behind. However, there are other stories about the 50-year-old school. Stories that would send chills up the spines of the younger generation that heard it. Stories that compelled younger students to break into the school and search around. One tale that I heard was a girl had fallen down the stairs and died. People claimed to see faces in the windows at the back of the school around the night. The people who broke and claimed they heard the murmurs of children. The PA system clicking on and off and things breaking. That's when a group of my friends decided to stay the night there. I was only 16, most of my friends only a year younger. So there we were, a bunch of 15 and 16 year olds about to spend the night in an abandoned and supposedly haunted school for kicks. My closest friend, Emily, was probably the most frightened of all. I tried to remind her that the stories were not true. And the only story that was true was it simply abandoned the school because it was old. She retorted with the fact that school was only constructed in 1950, not too old by school standards, and I couldn't disagree. The true story just made no sense at all, and suddenly the false story started sounding a lot truer. We had decided on breaking into Florence in the usual way. There was a shattered window near the front door on Friday night. It was already Wednesday, and with all the stories, they could suddenly be the true one. I started to get paranoid. Plus, there was a fire that many children died in. Maybe it was a teacher that fell down the stairs and died. Maybe there was a shooting incident. Whatever the reason, I could not locate it anywhere. I checked the local news website for information on the Florence. All I could find was an article about being bought by a landowner. Apparently, the landlords were originally intended on turning into an apartment complex, then, for whatever reason, decided against it. And so the school sat there waiting to be renovated or demolished, neither happening for a long time. I slept uneasily that night, being startled awake, perceiving the no raising every couple of hours. As a fairly light sleeper, any sudden noises can wake me, such as thunder. The problem with it, though, is when there's no sudden noises should have been made at 3 in the morning, when everyone is asleep, and the weather is calm. All of that worried me. It was hushed while I was awake, and I eventually ended up going back to sleep. I spent the next day at the public library and reference section looking at newspaper articles from the 1950s. It was really beginning to trouble me that I had no idea what we were getting into. As I sat there reading the old articles, I started getting the feeling that someone was reading over my shoulder. Every few minutes, I would end up looking back over my shoulder only to see nothing. I was sure that people around me thought I was looking at something naughty and didn't want to get caught. Nonetheless, I continued looking article after article, finding only JFK assassination and other major events. If anything on the Florence, it was about soon getting recognition for doing things in community. I was starting to get a bit drowsy after a while, well with the lack of sleep and the repetitive nonsense I was reading. I started seeing shadowy figures out of the corner of my eyes, when they, which I attributed to drowsiness. I figured I should go home and take a nap to prepare myself for what would come next. Friday, 6.34pm. 
I'm writing down updates at regular intervals to record for future references. The haunting of Florence. If nothing happens today, it will prove that the school is in fact not haunted, and this journal will discourage others from trespassing and breaking the law as we are. Wish us luck. I took my ballpoint pen and closed the miniature journal. Dylan quietly laughed at me as I tucked them both into the, my pocket. He was Emily's boyfriend and new to at our school. He was interested in joining us in our undertaking. The whole group ended up being me, Emily, Dylan, Evan, and Tony. A couple more of my friends. Three boys were acting ridiculously as they strolled along the street, sidewalk towards the school. They walked a couple of feet ahead of me and Emily as we talked. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the shadowy figure again. I peeked over to what I thought it was and saw nothing. Emily took notice of this, though, and asked if I was alright. I told her I was fine and about my research in the library. She seemed concerned, but we both brushed it off. It was just paranormal getting the best of us. Friday, 6.49 p.m. We have successfully broken into the Florence. We are about to look around the school. It took a little effort to get in. I find it a bit disquieting that anyone can get in so easy. Schools need more protection. We clicked on our flashlights and took a good look at our surroundings. I couldn't see for a moment because I sneezed a number of times from the amount of dust in the air. When I ceased sneezing, the group was staring at me, obviously irritated. I shrugged in a manner which just had no control over it, and we continued on. For our astonishment, the classrooms still had desks in them, even though the desks were in a state of disorder. It was still interesting that the desks had not been removed. I figured everything would have been taken out when they planned to become an apartment complex, but no. Everything was still there. The desks, the books, there were even traces of writing left on the chalkboards. We made a game out of figuring out what used to be written there. Equations, literary terms, etc. Because one classroom that still had actual writing on the board, but we were a little apprehensive about after we read was said, so we left immediately without investigating the room. The entire time we moved from classroom to classroom, I couldn't shake the feeling of someone watching us, following us around. I kept seeing the shadows out of the corner of my eye, and so much that they were starting to become constant, I could see more of the figures. I was sure that they were figures of children. I mean, what else would have a shadow that tall? I don't mean it to anyone, not even Aunt, didn't mention anyone, not even Emily. I knew the rest of uh, ghosts and paranormal. They would have told me I was seeing things. I would not argue with them. I probably was. Friday, 7.09 p.m. We have entered a classroom on the second floor to find a desk in disarray, like in every other classroom. However, there is something odd about this room in particular. There is writing on the chalkboard. I do not see, feel safe repeating it. I'm starting to see more of the shadowed figures in the corner of my eye. I feel like they are watching. We wandered down one of the staircases to the ground floor. And as we did, a lot of us made a joke that was a famous staircase that a girl or teacher fell down. All of you were laughing. It was right to the knees, left over from reading the chalkboard message. On the lower level, there were bathrooms, a gymnasium, and a cafeteria. We explored one bathroom, but found the stench unbearable, and then I go into the, another. The gym was small, basically looked like a large bare room with markings on the floor for sports. There were no nets or benches. However, there was a scoreboard which looked like it might have been the highest standard in the 80s when I was dingy and broken. We spoke right there in the donation we could hear our voices echo. It was so barren, so dormant. We began to get anxious and left. We took to the cafeteria next and saw them. Many of the lunch tables were still there. I thought it was extremely similar to this scenario and brushed it off. We sat down on one of the tables to figure out our plan. 
Friday, 8.26 p.m. We have not yet decided where to sleep for the night. We suggested that I have been tossed around and none of them sound like decent ideas. The bathrooms are smelly, the cra classrooms are creepy, the gymnasium echoes, and the cafeteria seems like the only place worth being in. Who would know? It smells like mildew in here. Never mind. We decided on the cafeteria as our brain was time to push the tables out of the way and set up camp. We stood up from our very comfortable seats and positioned our fingers under the underside of the table for to lift and move it out of the way. Suddenly, Tony cried out and quickly let it go his grab from the table, leaving away frightened dimly. We looked down at the hand at the same time we did. I felt something under the grip of the table. I slowly, cautiously took my hand away and to look at it. The rest of the group did the same. Tony was a loud, gasping noise. I knew I had to look at my hands, but I felt I could feel the substance on my finger. I knew it was before I looked at it. I saw Emily was about to start crying and Dylan trying to prevent it. Me too was very shaken. Carly, Emily suggested we did not stay the night there. And I nodded the suggestion while Tony breathed. Emily sobbed and Dylan shushed. Back to the fingers of my jeans. Reminding myself to come up with a good excuse to tell my mother later. Then a sweet aroma filled the air. A floral scent. Like a sort of perfume, but was too strong. Remind me of younger girls when they would clothe themselves in their mother's apparel and makeup. I was putting on too much. With that thought, my eyes grew wide and I recalled the shadowy figure from earlier. Children. They were beginning to move from corner of my eye into reality. The sip proved it. I could hear the others whispering around me about the strange smell and this sat me out of my reverie. We picked up our things and started to jog towards the cafeteria door. We ran out in the hall but stopped in our tracks before you could make to the broken window. Right there in the center of the hall, just ten feet in front of us, was a small girl about seven years old. Could not make out her face, but she had brown hair tied in a ponytail with a bow. She wore a pink floral sundress. Just a feature to bow right in the front of her waist. And the feet she wore black shoes and white socks. After taking a good long look at her, I discovered that I could not budge or speak. So I continued to stare. And I did notice one other thing. She was standing right at the bottom of the staircase. Then she spoke in a tiny little voice. Where are you going? So casual, I thought. I was like she was asking a friend of hers that unexpectedly wished to leave after playing the other. I wondered, do we answer her? Do we answer the creepy little thing that was probably a figment of our imaginations? Or a worst? A ghost? Until that warning, she was no longer there. There's nobody at the bottom of the stairs. I breathed a sigh of relief and heard the others do the same. Then she reappeared closer. Now she's only five feet away from us. Half the distance she was before. I heard two, two people yelp and recognized the first as Emily. And I found the second voice was my own. Oh, this girl now right in front of us. I could now see that her neck was distinct, disfigured and you can see the bone protruding under the skin. From the look of her right arm, I figured that broken as well. It was very evident that she was the one who plummeted down the stairs countless years ago. You can also see her face, her bandage masked her eyes. You could tell it was glaring up at us. Her mouth, she gave us a large, daunting grin. She repeated the question, Where are you going? I thought this time someone should answer her, and somebody did. It was Evan who spoke. We were just leaving. That's caused the little girl to tilt. Her already tilted head even more. My legs began to quiver and I gulp. This is going to end badly. I thought, I need to write this down. People need to know. I tried to hear her speak again, not knowing if she would lash out or not. I dreaded that she might disappear again, not knowing where she would reappear if she did. The atmosphere grew denser. I found it more difficult to breathe. Taking one short, gasping breath, and a hand found its way on my shoulder. 
I jumped under his touch. I turned to find that it was only Emily. Before I got an opportunity to glance back at the thing, it took a good in the fries. Why don't you stay and play? I took a deep breath in and shifted my right foot to step forward. I was to find that I could still move. I moved in front of Dylan, just a notch over my right. I looked at the thing, it was still grinning. I wondered if its mouth moved at all when it spoke. My lips were still trembling, but I had thought of the perfect reply. My analogy from earlier seemed to act with the actual case. The girl thought we were playing and abruptly we desired to leave. It's getting dark out and our parents will want us home, I told the thing, sincerely hoping it was a case that it would work. The girl straightened her head and back up as much as she could with the broken neck. She did this very slowly and without altering her facial expression the entire time. The grin was starting to imping upon my very soul. I yearned to get out of there, the all my being. Then she disappeared and I did not wait for her to reappear. I ran faster than I ever ran before and the others followed behind me. Sweat was pouring off me and I squeezed out of the only exit. The shadow went by the front door as they left each other out. One by one, I could hear the quiet whispers of go, go, go from my friends still in the school. Once out, we took a moment to catch our breath and sideways walk away from the school. I could not believe, as frightened as we were, that we still managed to move and speak. Friday, 9.04 p.m. Never go into Florence Condon Junior High School. My encounter a being that was not natural and should never be seen again. I still cannot believe as writing this thing let us out. I can even ask why every few minutes. It makes no sense to me. The others just seem relieved to be out. They're lying in the grass of Emily's front lawn, sweating out their fears as I am writing out mine. I don't think any of us will ever forget the Florence Condon. Never. Nobody will ever believe us. I got home around 9.30 that evening and expected my mother asked the about the blood on my jeans. When she did not, I began to wonder if anyone else could see it. I looked at my hands just to make sure I saw they were still pinkish in the blood. After thoroughly cleaning my hands in the sink, I worked to my bedroom. I did not intend on sleeping that night, instead went straight to my computer. I spent all night trying to get my mind off the thing that ended up looking back over my shoulder. All those times when paranoia started creeping up on me. I could see those see shadows of children in my peripheral vision. I could hear them giggling. They called out to me. They told me I was being a coward. I listened to them all night until the sun came up. I was sure they were stopped when the sun came up, and for a while, they did. I heard nothing till the afternoon when I heard the voice of the little girl behind me. Turn, I saw the girl from, my, from before in my room. It asked me to play with me. Asked every single day afterwards. Sunday, 3.54 p.m. The thing did not let us out. We let it out. It asks us to on the chalkboard, and we did. Oh, God, what have we done?